Okay, so I'm going to talk about the regional integrated assessment, uh, but focusing mostly on what the teams are, uh, the ACMIC research teams are doing in Africa, and the focus probably more on, on the RAPs. Um, so a couple just background things, a uh, couple questions that we should have in mind when, uh, you know, implemented this type of uh, methods for regional integrated assessments. Uh, first, how to best use available data and models to assess um, the future food and environmental security of farm populations, in particular in those vulnerable regions. And then, uh, how to provide better answers to stakeholders with more robust projections of climate change impacts and benefits of adaptation. Uh, what is meaningful for policymakers? Are they interested in poverty, food security, health, or well, are we, as we were discussing yesterday, nutrition, for example, right? But we also need to keep in mind that we face many challenges, especially in these you know, regions in the developing world where we have a small but complex systems and we have heterogeneous populations where we can have people that may gain from climate change or may lose from climate change. Um, how we assess the trade-offs in economic and environmental and social uh, dimensions. And then we should also be able to do these out-of-sample assessments in space and time. In particular, we're talking about climate change into the future, right? And then we already know that we are dealing with multiple scales, scales subnational, national, and global. And then we have um, limitations in terms of data, data availability. So that's why. <clears throat> so ACMIC developed this protocol-based approach to be able to evaluate uncertainties, uh, to use ensembles in climate models, crop models. And we haven't done it yet in, in economic models. We hope to do that. We just started a, a new initiative called REMIP which is the Regional Economic Model Intercomparison Pillar. Uh, we're writing the protocols and discussing what type of data, what type of application we'll do. Um, I think we have, how many, you know, 10, 12 models probably that are willing to participate in this initiative. Um, then the idea is also to improve models and of course to address the challenges that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, key elements from this regional integrated assessment methodology are, of course, the use of pathways and the scenarios, uh, input data or output data from the global models, prices and productivity trends, and regional models that we can combine or link by physical and economic models. What John said yesterday, hybrid models, right? So just to review, I know you've already seen these core questions. Um, I'm just going to go quickly the ACMIP core questions. So the first core question that the, these teams are doing is, what is the sensitivity of the current agricultural production systems to climate change? So let's <laughs> assume this is, you can think about this as yield or another value like farm income in the current period. So if we bring climate change to this current period, assuming the effects are negative, then we have this effect, right, reducing this value. And that's the first core question that that we are dealing with uh, in NACMIC. Then the second core question is, what are the benefits of adaptation in the current agricultural systems? So assuming that we have a new technology or for example, a climate smart agriculture technology that we want to assess what are the benefits in the current period. That's our question number two. But now what if we want to do the analysis in the future, let's say 2050, so what is the impact of climate change on future agricultural production systems? So the key here is that we need to take this production system, move it into the future. But we know that you know, many conditions change in the future, socioeconomic conditions, technology change, prices, and that's why we need the representative agricultural pathways to represent the conditions in that future world. So we can do the analysis in that future world. And, this, and then if we bring climate change, then we can have these results, which is the core question number three. And then we can also ask, what if we adapt in that future world? That's the question number four. Uh, in the phase one of ACME for these different projects in Sub-Saharan and sub South Asia, we only had question one, three, and four. But the stakeholders were you know, strongly recommended that we should do 
question two. So that's why in this new phase, we included this new core question in the analysis. Um, and this would be the same case in case of, you know, when climate change has positive impacts in the system. So, and you already also seen this figure, how to link uh, specific pathways to SSPs, right? So we have the higher level pathways, SSPs or global wraps or other intermediate, intermediate pathways and the regional wraps that fit into the models. So we assume that there are drivers coming from the top to the bottom, but it's important to know that there should be consistency across the, the drivers. And we think this it should be kind of a nested approach. Now, there are different types of nested approaches, right? There's this, I, I got this figure from this uh, paper that was just published a month or two months ago, I think. Um, so there is the one-to-one -one approach where, where each global storyline is consistent with a single storyline at global scales. So it goes directly like this. Or the one-to-many approach where each global storyline is consistent with a range of alternative storylines at other scales. Yes, yeah, of course, this, this one would deal better with uncertainty, but if you think about the dimensionality of the analysis will start growing, right? Um, but also, it really depends where you are applying these wraps. Uh, and, and an example, if we plan to do an wrap in a country like Costa Rica and Central America, small country, maybe this approach is enough. But if we're thinking wraps in China, a big country, and last week we were in China talking about wraps with ACMIP China, and yeah, we realized that you know it's a big country, and I borrowed this figure from Adam from the presentation of yesterday. Sorry, I borrowed this without asking. <laughs> you can see China, and this is um, the, the projected water scarcity. So all the northern part of China has, you know, physical water scarcity, and while the lower part basically has little or no water scarcity. So you would assume that policies would be different in these regions, socioeconomic and biophysical conditions would be different, right? So in that case, probably this approach uh, may work better. So what are the ACMIP teams are doing in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia? You've already seen these metrics from uh, Brian, and I think I have the labels correct now. I don't know where it's, I think Brian, I think it's not here now. Um, <laughs> but following the same, the same way that the SSPs were constructed, these metrics, we also constructed a metrics for wraps. Uh, the difference is that the SSPs were constructed with challenges for mitigation and challenges for adaptation. We did this in terms of environmental sustainability and economic growth. Or if you want to think about that, just to represent the trade-offs between economics and environmental, and the, or the win-win synergies or lose-lose synergies. <clears throat> so in phase one uh, of ACMIP, all the teams started with kind of, of the middle of the road, SSP2, and developed a wrap also kind of middle of the road or business as usual uh, that we would say, and they use RCP 8.5. Now for this new phase, what they're gonna do is they're going to run SSP1 and develop a RAP4, which is sustainable low growth, using RCP 4.5. That's one set. And the other set is they're gonna run SSP3, which is this regional rivalry type of word, with RAP5, which is a more unsustainable high growth, high economic growth world, using RCP 8.5. Now, you, if you heard uh, Brian's presentation, uh, he said that SSP3 might not be able to reach RCP 8.5, right? And at the beginning, we were thinking ideally, we were planning to do SSP5, but right now, the global economic um, team, they run SSP1 with RCP 4.5 4 and SSP3 RCP 
And that, that's the data that will be available, and that's why basically we choose to do this to SSP3 with RCP 8.5. What are the implications we can discuss? Uh, I would like to, to hear what would be the implications, especially if we're thinking that we're running this to 2050. I don't know how different it would be in terms of the implications of running RCP 8.5, or if we need to change and do RCP 6 with this SSP3. So that's something that we can, we can discuss. Um, and this is just a summary of the teams. This is just Sub-Saharan Africa of the trends that several of the teams have developed. So we have in Zimbabwe, they developed two wraps, both of them in terms of business as usual, but with some uh, variance in terms of one is more pessimistic and one is more optimistic. Uh, then also Mozambique, there's one for Kenya, two for uh, New York or for Senegal. Uh, there is one for South Africa and one for Namibia. And these are the, the more pessimistic wraps. And with this trend table, as you see too, it's nice because you can compare what's happening across the different wraps, um, different countries, like for example, this variable soil degradation in a pessimistic world, basically all of the teams, of course, think that soil degradation will, um, will increase, so soil quality will be uh, lower. Or um, in the more optimistic world, soil degradation uh, will decrease, so soil quality will improve. And then just to recap some of the things that we already talked yesterday, some of these relevant questions for discussion or issues for discussion is uh, about the global models, the uncertainties, and you know, what are, are the implications of using the price and productivity tr trends from the global economic models. Um, the other issue is about the, using the regional models, the dimensionality. So we start thinking about the GCMs times RCPs, SSPs times the number of crop models we're using, the number of wraps, number of adaptations. <laughs> so you can start making a number, how big this type of analysis can start growing. Uh, the pathway and scenario uncertainty, and also, of course, the issue about scaling down or up with the scenarios and adaptations. In particular, in terms of adaptation, just we need to make sure that what the global economic models have in terms of adaptation is consistent with what the regional teams are developing in terms of the adaptation strategies or, or adaptation packages. And yeah, of course, talking about disaggregation or aggregation, which is scaling down, scaling down. And I think I'm just about the time.